Welcome back. I'm Chris Moore with HVAC Pro Blog, and this week I'm excited to present part three in a four part series on good practices for residential duct design. This week we're covering duct sealing, duct insulation, and of course duct testing. Without further ado, here's the training. Seal ducts using a method that will ensure long life, like using UL listed mastic. Everybody loves duct butter or paint or whatever you want to call it. I've spent my months painting ducts in crazy places like uh, restaurants and stuff like that. Um, you can see on the left, this is pre-sealing holes and seams. You have to seal that up. It's really easy to paint that stuff on. Um, I personally liked that style uh, duct sealer. There are some tapes. I tend to use gloves when I was using that metal tape with the, with the rubber on the inside of the tape. If it's UL listed mastic, it's gonna seal those holes, okay? So duct seal those holes. A lot of times I would put the tape and then seal over the tape if it was a large hole like this on the bottom left. Um, so the difference between holes and seams that have leaks versus no leaks, right? And if you're doing, um, an audit or you're doing a site survey in order to size the system, it's really important that you know the condition of the ductwork because if you're not gonna fix it or improve the duct system, you need to make sure you account for this in the loss, right? And, and the loads of, of, the, of those rooms and the loads of that building. All right, now in order to seal up, you don't just seal the main connections, right? You also have to seal boots to the floors or ceilings. Um, and a lot of times what I personally like to do is seal that with foam around, low, low expanding, fo low density foam. And then actually before I put the register on, I'll seal the inside of the fitting to make sure that all of that is sealed, all the air is coming to the condition space or in the return it's coming back from the condition space, right? We don't wanna pull air from a basement or an attic. Um, so really simple to do that. I actually used to use, just use a glove, stick my hand right into the, into the sealer and just, just get, get those fittings on the inside, right? It's really simple to do. Um, or of course, if you're using flex, the great thing about flex is it doesn't leak much, right? There's not a lot of seal uh, uh, seams that need to be sealed up. Um, but you have to make sure you connect it and seal it where it is connected. So you can see um, when you connect this to a, a register boot, you want to use the duct tie. I typically put a couple of screws in it to make sure it didn't pull out. And then I also sealed the connection there. Now, if you're not familiar with flexible duct design and how to install it correctly and seal it, I actually did a, a, a video on this. I called it Rules of Flexible Duct Design back in June of 20, uh, 2020. Um, which I'm sure we all want to forget those months during the pandemic. Um, but if you go back in the history here on Patreon, you can actually see this. Or of course, if you're watching this in the future um, on YouTube, a year later, I released Rules of Flexible Duct Design. All right. Um, next one on here, insulate ducts in unconditioned spaces. Now, ACA prefers you insulate it to R8 or R11 if you can. And you can see that's because of cost effectiveness. If you go above R11, what you're paying in order to insulate that duct system typically isn't going to return you any money, right? So it's just way more expensive to get that higher level of insulation. Now, in order to do the minimum required by code, it needs to be R8 if it's outside the building envelope or in an attic, right? If it's inside the building envelope, whether it's your supply and return, you should have R6 on there, unless your system and all of your duct system is completely inside the building envelope. Keep in mind, if you're in a humid climate, you're gonna wanna make sure you insulate that supply duct at least for obvious reasons. We don't want it raining in the attic or the basement, right? So you can see on the right-hand side, cost effectiveness of duct insulation R values, based on the if it's unconditioned attic or unconditioned crawl space, and what type of system you're heating with because of the temperature output, right? Uh, if you're in a cold climate, like here in the Northeast, um, New York, New England, right? And you have gas or oil, typically R6 to R11 will give you a good return for your investment. If you go above R11, it's not gonna return much money for you. It's not gonna drastically change the size of the system. But if you have a really low load home, you don't want the duct system, which is already the weakest part in your ceiling or floor to be a bigger heat loss, right? So low load homes tend to go a little bit more extreme on the R value of the duct system. Keep in mind, you wanna at least meet the level required by code, particularly if you're doing duct improvements, you have to, right? Speaking of sealing, so we talked about insulation. Of course, you want to duct seal before you do insulation for obvious reasons. Um, I highly recommend you start specifying a maximum of two 
2% for supply and return duct leakage, right? So 2% is actually sealed to extreme. If you need to seal to code for code purposes, the code requires four CFM per 100 square feet that the unit services at 25 pascals. That's actually notable. Now, in order to get to extreme, it's gonna take a, a little bit more uh, being meticulous with the duct mastic, or maybe even using something that seals from the inside mechanically, like um, there's those duct sealing, I don't wanna use names, duct sealing uh, equipment out there, right, that you can seal from the inside. Um, that would obviously get you well below extreme. Um, but if you can seal your duct system really tight and obviously it's within the building envelope it's going to be much easier to pull air from the condition space and get it to where you need it to get it to right and you're not going to have issues balancing and having unconditioned spaces uh, or big drastic differences across zones right um, duct leakage really leads to zone imbalance so if you specify a maximum of two percent and your team gets there uh, you can see it's going to be much easier and you have a much smaller duct system because you can get the air there and it's not going to impact the load as much, especially if it's in, uh, outside the condition envelope, right? Um, obviously, you want to require a test to confirm that 2% leakage was actually achieved, right? In order to meet code, you should be doing duct testing anyway. This is not always enforced across the country, but it is part of the mechanical code, the International Mechanical Code and the International Energy Conservation Code. So you can see the reference here, R403.3.3. The total leakage duct test needs to be less than 4%. And if you remember from that chart on the previous screen, that is notable when you start doing your load calculations. These are your, your selections for how well it's sealed. So if it's a new duct system, it leads, at least needs to be notable. You want to target extreme, maximum 2%, right? So what did you think? Did you like the training on duct sealing, insulation, and testing? If you did, I'd love to get your comments below on what part you feel is the most important. I'm willing to bet it's all three. If you like these videos and you want to get them one year in advance, head over to my Patreon page where you can subscribe for as little as $8 a month. Please be sure to come back next week where we conclude the four-part series on good practices for residential duct design. Next week, I'm covering the plan for repairs and how to address zone imbalances. Thanks for joining me at HVAC Pro Blog, where we provide advice for residential system design, quality installation, and system diagnosis. I'll see you soon.